We have an international expert in the arena of treatment of advanced prostate cancer, and I'm very excited to be able to chat with him today regarding a new treatment which is extending survival for men with advanced prostate cancer, so stay tuned. The show today is brought to you by our sponsor, the Prostate Health Academy. The Academy will be an essential community for individuals wanting to learn more about prostate conditions, connect with like-minded individuals, and improve their overall health. For those that are on our wait list for the Academy, you'll be receiving instructions via email yet this Saturday, July 24th, on how to log in to the Academy. For those that are not yet on the wait list, it is not too late. Just go to www.prostatehealthacademy.com to sign up. So the big question is this, how can men and those who care for them better educate themselves regarding prostate health, the conditions that affect the prostate, and the latest technology in managing these conditions? That is the question, and this podcast will provide the answers. On a weekly basis, we will be chatting with experts, innovators, and leaders in the field of urology, sharing useful information with the general public to improve their lives and increase their overall health. My name is Dr. Garrett Pullman, and welcome to the Prostate Health Podcast. Prostate Health Podcast is for informational purposes only. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as medical advice. By listening to the podcast, no physician-patient relationship has been formed. For more information and counseling, you must contact your personal physician or urologist with questions about your unique situation. We are very happy to have joining us on the Prostate Health Podcast today an internationally recognized expert in prostate cancer, Dr. Oliver Sarter. He is currently the Assistant Dean for Oncology at Tulane University School of Medicine, Medical Director of the Tulane Cancer Center, and the Laborde Professor for Cancer Research. His medical practice and research have focused on prostate cancer since 1990 when he finished a fellowship at the National Cancer Institute. He has published over 300 articles and book chapters and led multiple national and international clinical trials as either a principal investigator or co-principal investigator. He has lectured widely and at last count has given invited lectures in 28 countries. Dr. Sarter is definitely a world-renowned leader when it comes to the management of advanced prostate cancer, particularly in those patients who have failed initial therapies. Dr. Sarter, welcome to the Prostate Health Podcast. Glad to be here, and hopefully we'll have a good discussion. Well, you are definitely a world-renowned leader when it comes to the management of advanced prostate cancer, particularly in those patients who have failed initial therapies. We definitely have some exciting news for you to share for our listeners today. Now, before we get into that, I wanted to set the stage a bit with a few initial questions. The first being, now when we talk about treatment options for advanced prostate cancer, what does it mean to have advanced prostate cancer? Well, you know, it's a rather imprecise definition. You know, the one that we typically use is going to be metastatic prostate cancer is sort of a code word for advanced. And you can definitely have advanced prostate cancer without having metastatic disease, but for the purposes here, I'll just say metastatic disease. Then we kind of divide that into two. You know, there are people who are going to be sensitive to initial hormonal therapy and then those who are going to be resistant. The terminology has kind of evolved over the years. We used to call it hormone refractory prostate cancer. Today, we're more apt to call it castrate-resistant prostate cancer. So metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer is one of the advanced stages that we deal with. And it's very, very common because eventually people will develop resistance to the initial hormonal therapy. And then, of course, they're seeking solutions. What do you do next? Right, right. And you kind of touched on this a little bit, but, you know, when we talk about advanced treatment for advanced prostate cancer, what are some of the initial therapies available for men with advanced prostate cancer? Well, since 1941, we've been depriving men of their testosterone. And that lowered testosterone, we call androgen deprivation therapy, and that's been the cornerstone for many, many, many years. In about 2015, the use of chemotherapy in the metastatic castrate-sensitive prostate cancer was demonstrated to be effective. And there were a couple of trials that, that were done, one called the CHARTED trial, another called the STAMPEDE trial, and that was an important advance because we never had really done anything beyond ADT except for a little minor sub. And then we really had a bit of a breakthrough in my mind with the addition of abiraterone to conventional ADT. And abiraterone ADT was much better than ADT alone. And uh, actually more recently, we've shown that ADT docentaxel can have an additional effect if you add on the abiraterone with a trial recently published called PEACE-1. 
Then we talk about other novel hormones that have sort of followed abiraterone, and those would be apalutamide and salutamide. So today, most patients in the United States are probably going to be treated, if they present with metastatic disease initially, with energy deprivation therapy, something like alupavide, gosarelin, you know, one, one of these things that lowers testosterone, in combination with one of the novel hormones, and that'd be abiraterone, apalutamide, or insulinamide. That's kind of typically what happens today. Right. Well, thanks for sharing that. And so for our listeners, what are some indicators that the initial therapies for advanced disease are starting to fail? Yeah, so typically it's going to be a rising PSA. And then there's a little bit of a sequence of events. The radiographic progression can follow thereafter, and then symptoms follow thereafter. So there's a typical sequence, PSA first, then scans, and then symptoms. But it doesn't always work that way, but that's the way it typically works. Sure. So, Dr. Sarter, I'm very excited to be able to chat with you today regarding a new treatment for advanced prostate cancer. In fact, Dr. Sarter was the lead author on the newly announced results of the VISION trial just published June 23rd in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is an international phase three clinical trial. So before we get into some of the details of the study, as we are starting to transition more into personalized medicine in the concept of Theranostics, can you explain to our listeners what is Theranostics? Sure. Well, theranostics is sort of the idea that you might be able to image the disease and then treat it in a manner similar to the imaging. So here what we've utilized is a PSMA PET scan to identify those individuals that have PSMA or prostate-specific membrane antigen expressed on their cell surface. We can see the PSMA in the image, and then we're treating with PSMA Letitia 177, which is a beta emitter, and actually binding that same PSA molecule. But now we have a radioisotope, a little smart bomb, if you will, that can go in and radiate those cancer cells. So Theranostics is sort of the study where we see it treated, and its image-based biomarkers are really critical in this sort of new way of viewing the prostate cancer world. Oh, that's excellent. And can you tell our listeners a bit about the vision trial, including the goals and design of the trial? Sure. Let's talk a little bit about the population first, if you don't mind, and that's really important. You know, I mentioned earlier that people are getting the energy deprivation therapy, novel hormones, and docetaxel. Well, in this particular population of patients, people had to have failed energy deprivation, progressed despite a novel hormone such as abiraterone or enzalutamide, and progress despite docetaxel. So these are individuals who've kind of gone through the conventional therapies and yet still have progressive disease. So that patient population is a tough-to-treat population. That's kind of the first thing I want to let you know. The bottom line is we then created sort of a paradigm where everybody would get some standard of care. And that standard of care excluded chemotherapy because we didn't actually want to mix chemotherapy in combination with the PSMA lutetium. So the basic study design was standard of care, plus or minus lutetium-177, PSMA targeted, and then we were going to measure efficacy very simply, the most important thing by survival, how long do you live, but also by looking at radiographic progression for your survival, means how long do you go before your cancer progresses, and then other parameters such as tumor shrinkage, which we measure by CAT scans and MRIs and the like, and then PSA declines. So we basically designed the trial, standard of care, plus or minus PSMA Lutetium 177, in PSMA PET positive patients. So only in the population that had PSMA PET positive, and then looking at the outcomes by survival, progression, response, and by those parameters, we can pretty much figure out if it's working or not. Right. Well, we're going to take a quick break with a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. We are gearing up for the launch of the Prostate Health Academy. This will be an essential community for individuals wanting to dive in even deeper and learn more about the latest technology and treatments available to them for prostate conditions. In the Academy, you'll be able to interact with like-minded individuals in the private community forum and have access to exclusive bonus podcast after-hours video content with experts, innovators, and leaders in the field. We'll also be keeping you up with the latest evidence on prostate healthy diet and activity and creating a roadmap for you to keep you on track. For those on our wait list for the Academy, you'll be receiving instructions via email yet this Saturday, July 24th, on how to log into the Academy. For those that are not yet on the wait list, it is not too late. Just go to www.prostatehealthacademy.com to sign up. 
and you kind of touched on this a little bit when talking about the concept of theranostics, but again, just to kind of review for our listeners, uh, how does lutetium 177 PSMA therapy work in treating advanced prostate cancer? Okay, well, let's back up a little bit to the PSMA PET scans, and those are currently FDA approved in the United States, although not reimbursed, so it's a little bit of an awkward spot, but we do have PSMA PET approved in the United States, and PSMA PET, positron emission tomography, uses a little positron emitter, and the one that is FDA-approved is F-18, and another one will be FDA-approved relatively soon with gallium-68. You take a little molecule that binds to PSMA on the surface of the cell, and with the PET imaging agent, the gallium-68 or F-18, you then let it circulate in the blood, bind, and then do an image. And that image can tell you where the cancer is. It can also tell you if the cancer cells express that molecule, are not. So as we go forward, we're only going to be treating those individuals in the vision trial for those who had PSMA positive PET scans, at least one metastatic lesion greater than liver. A little bit of misunderstanding about how we did the selection, but it's pretty simple, really. Had to have a metastatic disease greater than liver. But we were concerned about individuals who are PSMA negative, because if you're PSMA negative cancer, then we're not really going to treat it with a PSMA targeted agent. So we did cross-sectional imaging, looking like CAT scan and MRI. And if you had a visceral lesion, say, in the lung or the liver, that was more than one centimeter in size, and it was PSMA negative on the PSMA PET, we said, nope, we don't want to treat you because you have PSMA negative disease, and we believe it's metastatic, and we don't want to give you a therapy that's not going to work for that lesion. Same thing is true for lymph nodes. The lymph nodes got to be 2.5 centimeters or greater, and they were PSMA negative. And we said, no, we're not going to treat you. Turned out that of the patients who were scanned, and we scanned a little over 1,000 patients, that about 87% of the patients were actually eligible based on the PSMA PET. So it turns out we weren't really sure what to expect, but 87% of the patients we scanned were eligible, so the vast majority were actually eligible. That's great. So what did the vision trial then demonstrate when looking at this new treatment? Well, what we found is, and I think most importantly, is that overall survival was improved. The control group had a median survival. Remember, median is a kind of a point estimate. It's in, you know, if you run the experiment 15 different times, you may come out with a little bit different numbers. But the median was about 11.3 months in the control group. And we got up to about 15.3 months in the PSMA lutetium group. Another way to view that is a reduction in the risk of death, and that's called a hazard ratio. The hazard ratio for death was 0.62, and 0.62 means a 38% reduction in the risk of death over the course of the study, and that's really quite good, particularly in these very difficult-to-treat patients. So overall survival was better. We then looked at radiographic progression-free survival, and the risk of progression was reduced by 60%. We had a hazard ratio of 0.4, so that's really good. And then we wanted to ask questions about tumor shrinkage. And the tumors shrank a little more than 50% of the time when they had measurable tumors. If it's in the bone, you can't really measure it. But say you have a lymph node or something in the liver or lung, you can measure it. And those individuals with measurable disease, the disease shrunk about 50% of the time. So that's good. And then PSA declines confirmed were about 46%. So whether you measure success by PSA decline, by radiographic shrinkage of tumors, by the prolongation of progression of the patients, or survival, we were successful in all of these parameters, which I think is really nice to see. I'll just simply say a very, very positive trial. Well, and we really appreciate all of your work in that and congratulate you on, on those findings as well as your team. So while the vision trial looked at men who really had, you know, no other options and had failed initial therapies for advanced disease, do you anticipate this will at some point also be an option even earlier in the stages of the disease? Right, and that's going to take additional trials. I do want to give a little bit of a caveat about other potential options that could have been given to these patients. So let me go there first, and then I'll talk about the earlier stages. So. You know, some of these patients, a little bit over 40% had actually received prior cabazitaxel, which is a second-line chemotherapy. Some of these patients maybe have been eligible for additional chemotherapy, so that would have been a potential option. Sure. Also, some targeted therapies that 
we now know about, and these are things like the PERP inhibitors, which are effective in a subset of patients called homologous recombination repair defects, and these are mutations in certain genes in the tumors. And then another one called pembrolizumab, which is only about 3 or 4%, but it's found in, in, effective in tumors that are, quote, deficient in, mis, in mismatch repair. So we have homologous recombination repair deficiencies, and that may be 15% or so. And then we have the mismatch repair deficiencies, maybe 3 or 4%. Those may be suitable for effective therapies that are known today. And some of the patients could have been treated with radium, uh, radium-223 for bone-targeted agents. That's been shown to prolong survival in certain settings. And then, of course, there's a whole variety of clinical trials. So, you know, the people, even though they had relatively limited conventional options, they may have been eligible for certain other therapies. Sure. Now, mm-hmm. that said, let's talk about bringing it earlier because there's a lot of interest in that. And there's a trial now called the PISMA-4 trial that's already accruing patients, and that's going to come in the pre-chemo space. So now instead of having to have failed androgen deprivation, a novel hormone, and a chemotherapy, now they could just have failed a novel hormone and the regular androgen deprivation. Chemotherapy doesn't have to be pre-given. So that trial is now beginning to accrue, and they'll have some similarities in design. We're going to be looking at radiographic progression-free survival, in the new PSMA-4 trial, there's going to be a crossover, however. So patients on the control arm would be able to cross over and receive the PSMA lutetium after they had radiographic progression. There's also another trial called the PSMA addition trial, and that's going to move it all the way up front in the castrate-sensitive disease metastatic. And here we're going to be looking at things like ADT abiraterone plus or minus the PSMA lutetium. And I should also mention another trial called the SPLASH trial. And the SPLASH trial is also going to be looking at that metastatic CRPC, if you will, and be looking in the pre-chemo space. So we've got to move closer to the beginning of the disease instead of being so late stage. But the vision, we demonstrated this effective in late stage, so we think it will be effective in the earlier stages too. Well, it'll definitely be exciting to continue to follow the results as they come out in the future, and maybe we'll have to get you back on the show at some point to kind of look at that again. Well, we are running out of time here in the podcast, but good news. Dr. Sarter will be sticking around with us after the show to record some valuable bonus content for the upcoming Prostate Health Academy. We'll be going into even more detail about this new treatment, including the steps for someone to find out if they may be a candidate for this therapy, but also how they may find a center or institution offering it. To sign up for the Academy, just go to www.prostatehealthacademy.com. So, Dr. Sarter, any final thoughts today for our listeners? You know, we didn't really talk about toxicity, and I think we should. You know, one thing is that it's a little bit of a surprising side effect is that PSMA is actually expressed in the salivary glands. So we're going to be radiating salivary glands, and dry mouth was a significant issue in some of the patients. Uh, over 30% of the patients reported they had some dry mouth. There's a little bit of bone marrow suppression. Significant anemia was present in about 12% of patients. And a little bit of changes in the white cells and the platelets were also noted. But overall, really pretty well tolerated. Some fatigue. But I will say that in terms of kind of the risk-benefit ratio, I thought it was very favorable for this age. Yeah. Well, that's certainly great to hear. And uh, well, Dr. Sarter, thank you so much for illuminating us today about this new option for men with advanced prostate cancer, solid gold. I know I can speak on behalf of all of our Prostate Health Podcast listeners uh, that we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us today. Thanks again. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you again for listening to the Prostate Health Podcast. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at gpullmanmd. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode.